Welcome to the Dream Life is Real Life podcast with your host, Hannah Hermanson, bringing you real life stories of people who realized their dreams to educate and inspire you to create your legacy of abundance now. Okay, everyone, I am so, so excited today. We are hanging out with my soul sister, Stephanie Mitchell. She is the founder of The Rolling Mat. It's a mobile yoga studio based in Atlanta, Georgia. Since the start of her mobile yoga adventure, Steph, aka The Rolling Yogi, has been shaking up the yoga industry by providing well-rounded, community-driven yoga experiences outside the four walls of a studio space. She is the beer yogi of Atlanta, and she's also made uh, substantial partnerships with large corporations other than breweries, such as Whole Foods, Keller Williams Realty, AT&T, and Health Source Chiropractic in Atlanta. She's traveled the world, bringing her creative pop-up studio and concepts to festivals, other breweries, and large-scale events. This year, Steph decided to take all of her knowledge and experience from being a small business owner in the yoga industry and put it to even bigger use. Alongside her public events and corporate partnerships, Steph is a business mentor who serves to assist other yoga and heart-centered entrepreneurs in creating their vision and empire while owning their confidence and truth. She leads monthly workshops in Atlanta and other travel locations on how to mindfully and strategically build businesses. Welcome, Steph. Hey, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so I kind of mentioned, well, I excitedly explained at the beginning of the show that we are soul sisters because as much as you yes, fear and yoga and business, ironically, we were just chatting before the show, you have a background in higher education and choir and you're blonde. It's like, yes, we're sisters. <laughs> uh, yeah, I totally agree. We have a lot in common. So I am always interested in how people get from where they were, right? You were working in higher education, working with college students to where you are now. So give us the highlight reel of your evolution from the nine to five to where you are now. All right. So yeah, I, um, I worked for a really elite um, academic honor society here in my hometown of Atlanta and loved my job. I got to travel the U.S. going to different colleges and speaking to um, you know students that were about to graduate from college and really inspire them on what the next steps were and kind of what the world looked like outside of college. Um, so it was super rewarding for me. I'm a wandering spirit. So the travel aspect of it was great. Um, loved everything about the job. Um, but I had the unfortunate, um, situation of being laid off, um, due to some declining, um, aspects that were going on. Um, so at the time I really had no idea, what I was going to do. Like this was really kind of my, my big job, my big girl job. And I loved it. So I actually went out West for California to um, San Francisco and beyond for about two months, Um, stayed with friends out there and really came to realize how much the yoga practice has always been part of my life ever since beginning of college um, how much it has healed me, uh, healed me at the time. And without even really realizing, um, that it had all of these qualities and properties for me. Um, so I practiced with a ton of yogis out there, went to different studios and I decided that I wanted to get trained and take it to a different level. And, um, while I was in my training, I there also realized that, I didn't want to just be an in-studio teacher. I wanted to do so much more. And um, that's kind of how the whole idea of a mobile yoga studio evolved. Yeah. Okay. I love that because, yo, same thing. I was working at a college job and, you know, ended up wanting to take my yoga practice longer. It's just so amazing Yeah, how those journeys evolve when you just kind of dial in. Okay. I have this opportunity. Maybe you're laid off. Maybe you're miserable in your job. It's like, oh, Mm hey, I enjoy yoga. Let me try that path. So I think, especially, I know a lot of yoga teachers are listening and I think it's really unique, especially that soon in your yoga career to be thinking outside the walls of a studio. 
So mm-hmm. did you ever, I mean, the common the practice is to become an assistant or go to a gym and teach there for, you know, 15 bucks an hour <laughs> and get better at it. But did you ever take a traditional approach to building a yoga business or did you just jump into the van and take it everywhere with you? I approach, I, I put the cart in front of the horse, really. Um, I took as many opportunities as I could, uh, more so trying to get out into the community versus being stuck in a studio. Not that a studio space is, is bad whatsoever. Um, I love practicing being a student inside of a studio space. Um, but I, you know, sought out, there was actually a company within um, Atlanta that worked with corporate corporations and brought yoga and other different styles of exercise to the uh, corporate workplace, which also kind of transpired my corner corporate partnership um, branch that I have to my company. Um, so that's kind of where I started. I started out in the community, but then I also did have my fair share of working in LA fitnesses, teaching a nauseating number of classes to people that didn't really care about the full well-roundedness of yoga. They just wanted to work out, you know? Um, and then I, I did, I tried to get, you know, jobs at yoga studios, but because of my business and what I was doing, I was often looked at as competitive. So a lot of times trying to work part-time in a yoga studio didn't quite work out for me. So I just kept growing the rolling mat, took as many opportunities as I could. And then the beer yoga started up, which became really popular. I was working at a brewery at the time of my training and I actually had communication with the public there and asked them what they thought about beer yoga events. And they were like, well, if you offered it, we would do it. And um, I just really started to that kind of became my baby in the business in a sense, and that I grew it from only three people to 30 people. Mm. Okay. This is the nugget I'm picking up. Do or try be open to a lot of things. And I think something Mm -hmm. that you are demonstrating that a lot of people are holding back on is to just take the imperfect actions, right? Like, okay, LA Fitness needs help. Sure, I'll do it. I learn from that. I make some connections. And I think you are just a great example, like you said, of getting out into the community, talking to the people Mm -hmm. at your job, at the brewery you work at about what you've got going on. Because so often the ideas just percolate in our head and we make up all these excuses for why we shouldn't do something or why they won't like it. And so what do you think fueled you or helped you move past that common fear of just taking imperfect action and trying a lot of things when you were growing this business? I had nothing to lose. And I knew that I had so much to gain. And through everything that I had been through prior to being trained and getting my training and all the learning and self-development that and self-realization that came from all of that. I mean, I just knew that I had to, I had to just do, I had to go out and do, and I, and I wasn't going to get anywhere by being shy. And, and, you know, if I taught a class and it didn't work out very well, well, I learned from that. And typically when you're a yoga teacher, you know, if you mess up, if you're able to have kind of a quick reaction time, It's kind of like when you're, you know, a guitar player on stage, like a musician on stage, if they miss a chord, the audience doesn't really hear it, you know, because they pick right back up. You know, you forget to do one thing. You just like, oh, you get creative and you turn around and fix it, you know. So I just, um, you know, I, I was told in my training that I had to teach basically until burnout in order to earn my keep in the, in the yoga That's not, yeah, not quit that school. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it was, it was a great training and I wouldn't take it back for, for the world, but, um, you know, people say this all the time. Like I used to teach yoga and actually the studio I used to work at just closed overnight. And I was talking to some other mm-hmm. yoga teachers and there's still this like common philosophy that it's hard to make money in the yoga business. No one wants to charge too much. And it's not even just yoga, right? It's the servant mm-hmm. mentality that school teachers have. I live with one mm-hmm. and he doesn't think that they should earn. I mean, of course he would like more money, but that's not what it's about. You know, it's about service, right. it's about helping, it's about teaching. And so how do you, what kind of like reaction or support do you give? Cause I know you work with other heart centered entrepreneurs, servant leaders. Mm-hmm. 
how do you help facilitate the mindset that you can be massively successful in income and still be heart centered? How do you talk to that? Well, it's really a lot about their own kind of personal visualization and also learning and understanding and believing in the successes that they've already had. So something that was super effective for me, especially when, when you and I met was the success journal, you know, journaling in on thinking back to like your earliest memory, like, were you a punctual student? Did you do your chores when you got home to, you know, how you, uh, helped out your employee, um, your, your, or your coworker, you know, in your first big time job, you know, all of these things that you did along the way that really kind of help you build up to your worth and knowing that, you know, we are leaders. Like I am a yoga leader. I, I, I look at myself as a yoga leader and the yogis that I work with, that is what I'm trying to help them get into the mindset of is that we are valuable. I mean, it's just kind of like personal training or therapy in a sense, like you pay your personal trainer for better physical health. You pay your therapist for better mental health. Yoga kind of wraps both of those into one. I, I feel, Mm -hmm. um, So I think it's just really about, you know, visualizing everything that you know you're capable of, being able to sit in that and not feeling ashamed of any failure that you may have, looking at it as a learning thing, a learning curve, um, and just knowing that, like, you you are valuable. And that's, it's, it's a lot of mindset practices and a lot of visualization routines that, you know, really help them pull out, oh, you know what, like, I did this five months ago for this person and it changed their life. And I have a deal to prove it. It's like, well, show that girl, you know? Yeah. There's so much. That. That. Yeah. yeah. Focusing on the successes you have, mm-hmm. owning your strengths, you know, like you mentioned, strengths. Strengths. Oh, back in the day I was a punctual student. Like we, when you um, don't just look at rewarding yourself for the right thing, but like mm-hmm. you said, like reward yourself for the chances you took. And it wasn't a failure. You learned from it and you survived it. And I can go help someone else survive something similar. I think, um, well, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. It, I mean, it's a lot of my own experience because with this business, I mean, I have taken my love of yoga, which is a very mindful, heartfelt and joyous practice and merged it with business, which is very gritty, can be very, is very gritty, (laughs) you know, very gritty. Sometimes, you know, depending on what industry you're in, I mean, really doesn't, doesn't matter what industry you're in. It's, it's it's competitive, you know, and especially with yoga, like it's very oversaturated, uh, very oversaturated market. So I had to really learn and I had to take a lot of falls. I had to take a lot of fails And I had to really learn how to balance out this whole mindful aspect of yoga in with being a successful girl boss, the successful entrepreneur, because I knew that I had both aspects and my getting out there and doing, you know, came from years of already being out there, talking to people, you know, trying to share with them, you know, my worth so that they could see what their worth was, you know, at a young age, fresh out of college, you know, or events that I would plan. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of value in just taking time and and kind of doing some self-reflection. And a lot of people are scared to do that because of, you know, other things that might pop up, but it's just stuff that you eventually have to face anyways. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Lots, lots to think about here and kind of, um, marinate on. So you have clients that come to you who have both the yin and the yang, the masculine, the feminine, the soul centered (laughs) mindfulness practice, whatever, but then they also have this desire and this grit. So what is the first step you ask people or you encourage people to take when they decide I'm going to take my passion and turn it into a business? What's the first thing you recommend people do? The first thing I recommend them do is uh, get really clear on what it is that they're wanting from it. So what is it that they want? Where do they see themselves? You know, what it looks like, who's with them, what it feels like, what they're doing, who they're serving, and then the why, you know, like, why are they doing all of these things? 
Um, because if you're not fully clear, and this is, this is, this is what a lot of yogis I have found. And this is what I struggled with too, is we just kind of come out of training. You know, we're not really taught any other ways of running a business other than teaching in a studio or maybe opening and running our own brick and mortar studio. Well, not everybody wants to do that. Some people do, but not everybody does. But we kind of come out of it like, oh, I want to serve everyone. Like yoga is for everyone. I always say that yoga is for everyone, but not every pose is for everyone, you know, kind of thing. So it's like, you've got to figure out who you want to serve, like whether it's kids, teenagers, elderly, you know, corporate, whatever the case may be, you've got to figure out who you want to serve and, and what that journey is going to look like and where it's going to take you. Because without a clear visualization, you're just kind of shooting that, you know, an empty playing field, really. You can't just come out and be like, okay, I'm going to serve everybody, you know, and as yogis, that's what we want to do. We want to break, we see the benefit in this practice. We know how valuable it is but you've got to have a structured path. And a lot of yogis get intimidated by, by doing that because they don't want to pigeonhole themselves, if you will. But the fact is you got to start small and then that this, that audience will eventually grow into something that you never thought it would, you know? Um, Yeah. That visualization piece, right? Like working to get clear on what it's going to look like. And I think it takes, effort, right? To get to that clarity. So how do you, and I know this is something you help clients get a clear picture in their head of where they're going. Cause in order to get there, you got to know where you're going. So do you have any, um, tips on how to get more clear? Did that make sense? Are you with me on mm-hmm. expediting mm-hmm. the clarity process? <laughs> mm-hmm. So whatever industry or business it is that you're running, um, I find this to be super effective and a lot of people might hear this and think like, Oh, this is so like yoga. And I mean, it is, it it comes from my practice for sure, but anybody could benefit from this. Um, taking five or 10 minutes just to tune out as best you can. And it gets easier over time. But what I find to be most effective is in the morning, don't start by looking at your phone. Don't start by opening your computer and reading your emails Start by sitting, start by just sitting comfortably. You can be on your couch. You can be cross-legged. It doesn't matter. Close your eyes or stare and just dim the mental light bulb for a moment and try to let all the, cause you're most fresh in the morning, right? By the time you get to the afternoon and into the evening, your mind and brain has already started. It's already seen so many things throughout the day. So starting fresh and clean in the morning, just with a brief, you know, breathe deep breaths and just dim that mental light will help you, you know, kind of understand what it is, like what your goals are for the day, what your goals are for the week, for the month. And with that dimming of the light, try to get a little bit of, you know, a couple minutes of visualization in there of where, what do you want your day to look like? You don't even have to start with like your full life. Like, what do you want your day to look like? or an event that you're going to, or that you're, that you're speaking at, like, how do you want to be represented? And just start with it. And people think that, you know, taking this, this time for themselves, oh, I don't have time to do that. I, I'm so busy. It's five or 10 minutes is like all you have to do to just start the day off with a clear head and a level mind. And then that way you'll be able to prioritize a bit better. And I've always learned too, to when you start your day, when you start your list of priorities, do the things that you don't like, especially first, Mm -hmm. eat the fry. (laughs) Yeah. Get them out of the way. And then that way you can focus on the things that you really love. Yeah. I think that's such an important reminder. And I have to admit back when I was working nine to five, multiple jobs, I was much better actually at setting aside that time because I didn't want to jump into my phone. (laughs) I was, you know, I was Mm -hmm not as excited about my work and as an entrepreneur and having a little bit less structure, I really have to um, force myself, right? Like not have my phone in the bedroom so that when I wake up, my first thoughts are more dim. I like the way that you said that dim the light. And if you are rolling your eyes or like Stephanie said, thinking this is oh so yoga, um, Mm -hmm. it's, it's the way our brains work, right? 
sorry, our brains work this way, right? That if we have so much noise and light going on, we will never get to that clarity. And as much as we can do market research and interviews and getting into action, we need that clarity, like clear space in our head for the clarity to funnel in, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. So good. And I know this is something you work with clients to, um, you know, build that routine and also get to that clarity more quickly, right? Yep. It's one of my um, many exercises that uh, that we work on. And everybody comes to me in, in different phases. You know, some people are really clear on what they want, but they don't know how to execute it. You know, they don't know like the, the next steps to take or, you know, they feel like, OK, well, you know, I know what I want, but I know that I still need to go off and teach like 10 classes a day, you know, to make my yoga mark. And I'm like, no, that's <laughs> That's not what, what another way. Let me show yeah. you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the business of yoga is a huge, important aspect that unfortunately is oftentimes neglected in teacher trainings. And I, and I notice this from the yogis that come to me and they ask me a zillion questions after one of my events, like, how are you making this sustainable? I had to quit doing yoga and being a yoga teacher and go back to corporate because I wasn't making any money. Like, how are you doing this? You know, like we were never, you know, we were only taught about insurance. And a lot of times I find that yogis are paying a lot of money for insurance as well. So, you know, it's something that's super important so that we can have effective yoga leaders out in the, in the yoga industry and not ones that are suffering because it's not suffering a routine, right? I mean, it's supposed to bring us longevity and and all of these wonderful things and balance and sanity. But as yoga teachers, we, we start losing sight of that and oftentimes become very unauthentic because we're teaching so much and not to the audience that really well respects us. Yeah. And that goes back to that sort of servant leadership mindset. Like you think you're helping people by not charging them or by teaching all of these classes kind of haphazardly or Mm -hmm. and when you really start to think about the energy that you bring to that space, is it really in alignment with abundance and ease Mm -hmm. or are you hustling and grinding and just forcing down dogs left and right. Right. (laughs) Right. Well, there's a time for community service, right. For our selfless service, there's time for that. But, and that is oftentimes what yoga teachers feel like, okay, well, my services should just be free because this is a selfless service. And that comes from not really understanding their direction and also not having any sort of idea of their worth. And it breaks my heart you know, when, uh, when I see yoga teachers really pounding it and teaching so many classes and and thinking that, Oh, it's okay that I only charge $5. Like, no, it's not okay that you're only charging $5, you know, like you got to own your worth. And that's what I'm trying to strive, uh, to help other yogis and heart centered entrepreneurs themselves, because they're also creative in their own way of, you know, helping, helping people out holistically, so yeah. owning your worth. Yeah. It's yeah. Yoga boss. Yeah. <laughs> it can be done. Well, Stephanie, as our former academic selves, we're reaching the pop quiz section of this show. You've already given us a lot of action steps, but tell us three things. I have three last questions for you. First one is what is something listeners can do today in action that will help them get closer to their dream life? Well, the first one is, is get out and do right. Um, I have found, you know, I, I attend a lot of workshops that, that are within, you know, the business realm, the yoga realm, but sometimes, you know, I, I went to a networking event the other night and it was a room full of attorneys who are all women and they all had like really amazing stories. And sometimes it's, it's good to kind of branch out of your network and learn what other people are doing. Because the more you do, right, the more you do, the more you're learning about yourself, you're learning about other people, you're learning about your potential market, um, the, the better you're, the, the faster you're going to get to more of your visualization in your ideal life. 
Um, and the next thing would be something, an action step that you could definitely take today is implementing that five to 10 minute mindfulness routine. Try it, you know, two to three days a week, and then maybe you do it every day. Yeah. Go out and do, get around other people. <laughs> and yeah, go out and do, yeah, just do, talk to people. I love it. And then take those minutes in the morning. Beautiful. Question number two is what's a tangible resource or a gift you would love every listener to get their hands on? So there's a book that um, I got a while back. And honestly, I was kind of intimidated to pick it up and start reading it. I didn't feel like it was it was time uh, at the time. Um, but over the Christmas break, this this last Christmas, I finally read it. And it's Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert. And it is a, is a book or an audio book or whatever that I think everybody should read, especially if you are, you know, an entrepreneur, because entrepreneurs, like we are creative minds. We're constantly thinking, we're constantly innovating. We, we, we have all of these ideas and it's basically about, you know, how to live your creative life and be okay with some of the struggle that, you know, you might have to go through, um, it's, it's, it's a fabulous book. So Big Magic by uh, Elizabeth Gilbert. I would definitely recommend that. Beautiful. Big Magic. And I remember she talks a lot about like, well, maybe it was just my own takeaway from that book was like permission. Permission mm-hmm. to be a little creative or woo-woo or heart-centered or on this mm-hmm. big, um, for your own self. Yeah, as, as an individual. So Yeah, and another, another thing she mentioned too that really rang true to me was like, don't, don't feel... Um, cause you know, when you're starting out on your own and, and you're running your own business, sometimes you have to work a couple, you know, you might have to work a job. Like I bartend on the side sometimes when I first started out, um, not to let that, you know, affect you in a negative way. Like you appreciate those moments yeah. once you kind of start moving through and becoming successful and you start seeing things start to work and you have your triumphs and your successes so she had talked about a friend who just put all of his effort into writing, thinking that he was just going to be a millionaire after he wrote his first book and gave up on writing because he didn't make the money that he wanted. So something to keep in mind, like you, you've said it before, you will burn out very quickly if money is your ultimate focus. So Hard okay to have. Baby. yeah, purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Lastly, Stephanie, where can people stay connected with you and learn more about the work you do? So the best way to um, get connected with me is going onto Facebook and joining the Rolling Mat community. Um, there I give some you know, tips, tricks, advice. You can connect with other yogis and heart-centered entrepreneurs in that group. Um, we have conversations you know, about different business topics, about fun things to do over the weekends. Um, And it's just a really great place to connect with others as well as stay really personally uh, connected with me. So I offer a lot of valuable information um, on that group. And you can also keep up to date with any new things that I'm implementing in my business or when I might be rolling through your town. (laughs) The Rolling Mat community. Thank you so much for sharing your heart and story today, Stephanie. Listeners. Thank you, Hannah. Oh, yes. Always fun. Uh, Listeners, I'll be back next week with another inspiring guest that will help you make your dream life your real life. Until then. You've been learning how to make your dream life your real life with Hannah Hermanson. To get the resources mentioned on today's show and to listen to past episodes, visit www.dreamlifeisreallife.com. 